I'd like to say hello and good evening to everyone. Uh, if you are here to find out if information is real, if it's fake, if it's AI, should I trust it? You're in the right place. My name is Angela Cox, and I am one of the reference librarians at the Richmond Public Library. And we have to thank for this program um, some of the friends, or should I say the entire friends of the Richmond Public Library organization. Some of them are here this evening, and we couldn't do what we do without them. I'd also like to introduce our director of six months, Kate Epler. Okay, and so we have a wonderful speaker. Um, he is known to a lot of us here in West Contra Costa. He is the district coordinator for Supervisor Joya's office. He is an economic and policy advisor. Um, I first knew him as a journalist um, when he was a student at UC Berkeley and also through some of the documentaries that are at the Richmond Public Library on the history of North Richmond. And uh, I've met his children and his wonderful wife, and uh, we are lucky to have him, Robert Rogers. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Angela. And I'm gonna go ahead and give the ending away right off the bat in the beginning and say libraries are a huge part of what we need in our society as an antidote to disinformation. Libraries brought information to places that didn't have it in centuries before, especially in this country, have a rich tradition of bringing the light to places that did not have access to knowledge. And in to our time and in the future, libraries more and more have to be leaned upon as places where truth and science are valued, and there's a safe pursuit, a safe inquiry. Librarians not only are opening books for us today, they are opening the way for us to responsibly consume information in a world where that is ever harder to do. Again, I'm Robert Rogers. I'm really, really happy to be here, happy to be in Richmond, my town, uh, your town. This is really wonderful. Um, we're gonna try to be really brief and really tight with a whole lot of information. I want you all to let your, your questions germinate. I want your, your brains to really be active and I wanna have a really lively Q&A at the end. I wanna make the presentation uh, in a solid hour and then we're gonna have the Q&A is gonna be really lively and everything on your mind. There are no uh, off limits questions. I also want to introduce my colleague, Andrew Melendez. He is a scholar of note at St. Mary's College. He's done a lot of exciting research in these topics, and I'm really excited that he's gonna be helping us and participating tonight as well. So, why are we here, right? Well, what we need to do tonight is think about diagnosing the problem, understanding the problem in all its complexity, outfitting ourselves with the tools to be empowered to handle the problem, and also envisioning a roadmap for the future at our community levels and also government levels all across the country and the world. We need to have an idea of what a world looks like in a future when disinformation is not the grave threat that it is today. So let's start off by reading a quote right here. If anyone knows this, uh, I'll be giving you kudos points right away. Nothing can now be believed which is seen in the newspaper. Truth itself becomes suspicious by being put into that polluted vehicle. How dismal, how terrible. Wow, who said that? Was it an Instagram influencer? Was it a pundit on some extreme radio station? Was yes, it, sir. Was it Mark Twain? Well, that's a great guess, and you had that guess also. I love it, I wish it were. Uh, it's certainly something that he may have said, but in this case, it was, oh, it's Thomas Jefferson, yes. <laughs> and maybe unsurprisingly, note the year 1807, that's while he was serving as our third president. You see, before he was in power, he wrote a lot of lofty language about the value of the free press, the value of information, but once in office, he wrote this to a newspaper editor at the time named John Norville, and he was naturally angry about the nature of some of the coverage that he saw. So, 
That is to say, sometimes we feel like distrust in the media is some new concept, and it's something that comes about with social media and everything else, but in fact, it's not. History doesn't repeat directly, but it does rhyme. There are similarities. That's not to oversimplify it and say that what we face today is the same as what we faced then, but that distrust is there. And is it because of the imperfections of journalism, of information and so forth? Yes, but also it's because disinformation is inherent. It's endemic to a free society. We can't have one without the other. If we're going to have freedom, we're going to have to face this. Now, the question is one of levels. How do we manage it? How do we discern it? How do we see it in a way that's not right? Like right now, we are in a situation where we're being overwhelmed by disinformation, and that has all kinds of very grave implications for our society, our government, and all of our institutions. Very important study, and there's going to be a lot of data coming out, and that is really driving us. It's letting us know what we already know intuitively in our own consumption of news. Asked whether they agreed with the statement that national news organizations do not intend to mislead. Do not intend to mislead. That's a pretty low bar. They don't intend to mislead. Only 25% of Americans responded in the affirmative, right? This is the age of cynicism. And this is radically different than it was just a few decades ago. And we're seeing the effects of that permeate into all aspects of our society. So um, the cycle of media development, we've seen this over and over again throughout our nation's history. And our nation's important because the First Amendment, we're sort of on a limb, right? We go farther than European nations. We go farther than Asian and African nations all over the world. The First Amendment here is an outlier, and I'd argue it's a good thing. But that's why studying our press is really instructive for today. What we've seen, and this is starting with the colonial press in the 17th century, every time there's a tech innovation, in that case it was the printing press, there's adoption, there's an emergence of a social paradigm around that adoption, there are new threats that emerge based in part on that information that comes out, democratic backlash, and then a response and an innovation in media. The media changes for that time. Now, I'd argue that today we are right around number five and we're trying to angle into number six, but how we move into number six is extremely important and also to some degree unprecedented because the technology is so rapid, so powerful, we've never seen anything quite like that. Let's get a couple of definitions out of the way briefly. Disinformation and misinformation. And, and I know I said questions at the end, but let's get some back and forth right now. Disinformation, anybody have an idea of the difference? Disinformation and misinformation? Sure, sure. Well, yes, um, I, I think you're absolutely on the right track. Disinformation, the key here is intent, right? Disinformation, often sophisticated, done by bad actors who want to have a certain outcome that is contrary to the truth, are using technologies to promote disinformation. And this is really, really powerful. The tools they have available today are like nothing we've ever seen. Misinformation is more benign, but still harmful. And in fact, misinformation, of course, is sort of the cousin or, or the cart that's drawn by the horse of disinformation in the sense that when you've seen your friends, your colleagues, your uncles, your aunts, saying something on Facebook, sharing something that's clearly in your mind, sophisticated news consumer, not true. You might not blame them for that per se. They've shared misinformation unwittingly. They believe it. But the sophisticated actors that originated that, that's where the villainy really occurs. And today with the virality of our technologies, that gets unleashed. That genie gets out over and over and over again. And we still don't have a good idea of how to combat that. So, the challenge isn't new, but the technology in some ways is. Four in 10 experts, philosophers, media experts, and so forth, the universities surveyed say reality itself in this country is under siege. And that is to say our ability to have a shared reality is in large part gone. When you hear someone who's listening to different media all the time describe a nation that you can't understand, you know what I'm talking about. There's nothing, there's no campfire we are all getting around, to use your tribal analogy. There's no campfire we can all get around like CBS News at 7 o'clock and have some semblance of a shared reality. 
Now, in some ways, there, there are good things about that, that decentralization, that loss of authoritarian control of media, but there's also a lot of peril to that as well. Democracy, like I said, is not only under assault here, but around the world. Next slide, please. The components of democracy, we know what they are, and we see how they're under assault. Technology is a major factor, but it's not a determinant. Humans play a role here. We have power. We can make something happen. The ultimate paradox, I think, I would crystallize it down to say, would be the very democratic energies of our media systems, social media systems, web systems, and they are incredibly democratic. We can all be producers. We can all be sharers, distributors. We're all doing this all the time. Amazing, right? Share your truth, share that truth, whatever. That at the same time is deeply corrosive to our democratic systems. The paradox is that our democratic technology is exactly the other sharp end of the sword on our democratic systems. So we face a new dark age today, not one like previous dark ages, which were about a dearth of information, but now about a deluge of information. A lot of bad information, but deluge is important also because the volume is a big part of this as well. Too much, right? When you're overwhelmed all the time, what happens to your cognitive abilities? You can't make sense of things anymore. You become easy prey to those who want to use disinformation to push you some way. The deluge is a big part of what enables this to be so harmful. So what's more about this dangerous ecosystem that we have today to understand this? And we're going to go back to it. I just want to set the stage. The velocity is crucial. The velocity of information, the way that it travels everywhere. I can create fake news right now and the whole world presumably could see it instantaneously, right? And then share it. And they often do. And what kind of fake news often gets shared, right? The kind that's more fake, the kind that is outrageous, the kind that stokes those primal impulses of fear, outrage, and hate. Everyone is able to do that. Unfortunately, we're not always using those powers responsibly. At the same time, I mentioned the virality, right? The idea that once I've shared it, others share it. And what happens? It's a snowball going downhill. More people believe it. What do you believe more than anything else? Well, with the decline of democratic institutions, the de decline of information institutions, we rely more on those around us. And those around us are often, in part, being pushed by those same forces. So therefore, I don't believe CBS News or whatever, but I believe my aunt, my uncle, my neighbor, and oh, unwittingly, I've been pushed into algorithm silos that they're all saying the kinds of things that I want to say you can see how this becomes an existential threat to societies across the world. You can see how this is a friend to authoritarianism across the world. You can see how this is really dangerous for us here in America. What else do we have? Obviously, open to foreign attack. We'll go into that more. We, you know, newsflash, we were attacked in 2016 by the nation of Russia. There's just no doubt about it. Yet a huge amount of people don't believe that, right? disinformation paradox, you know, incredibly, the disinformation uh, movers on the Russian side were aided by the disinformation from the systems here. And so now we literally can't even comprehend that an attack actually occurred. I haven't gotten to the scariest stuff, the robots. What are they, right? AI bots are everywhere polluting this area and animating it powerfully. The AI bots are getting smarter with every moment. We're going to see it in 2024 like we've never seen it before. And six months from then, we'll see it again. It just, the rapidity is really dizzying. We have to act fast. Just a few months ago, an Israeli think tank put out a report noting that a whole swarm of AI bots had engaged in an information campaign against Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, these um, you know, participants in the Republican primary. So an entire swarm of automated bots, I mean, essentially a bot is a bunch of code created by a sophisticated actor, and the origin of which we don't know, but we have suspicions, has created automated machines that are creating information, telling stories online, having all the accoutrements of veracity, pushing all the buttons they know they need to push with sophisticated psychological inputs, and getting people to 
not like some candidate, not like another, driving wedge issues and laying a, a very fertile and noxious uh, soil for 2024. Now, all of this flies in the face in many ways of how we've always been brought up, what we've always thought, right? Intuitively, especially in America, we have sort of always been driven by this idea of the marketplace of ideas, right? This idea that, listen, we're all free, we can all share, there's going to be ups and downs, but the truth will always win out. Winston Churchill said, you know, you can account on Americans to always do all the wrong things, but they'll finally get to the right thing, right? Or they'll always do the right thing after they've exhausted all the wrong things. Martin Luther King said, the history, of the, the long arc of justice, history bends toward the long arc of justice, right? So we have this faith in democracy and freedom. And in some ways, that's being used against us now. The marketplace of ideas all the way up to just 10 years ago would have been almost universally acclaimed if I brought it up. If you ask people 20 years ago about the internet, about the web, about its effect on our democracy, it would have been almost across the board euphoric, utopian, right? Of course it's great. We will all be able to communicate. We'll be able to share resources. We'll be able to donate to campaigns. We'll be able to, of course, falsehoods can't exist. We'll just cite sources. It's going to be wonderful. Institutions will be held accountable. Uh, politicians can't get away from lies. People really said those, thought those, very intelligent people thought those kinds of things in 2000, 2004, 2010, 2015. People don't think that much anymore. We've been disabused of that notion in very stark terms and very rapidly. We know that this system can funnel this power to electeds and candidates who play to the algorithms, right? It can funnel power away from the people and to institutions that want to use disinformation to achieve other ends. We know that what this does to media is it makes them hunt for clicks, hunt for outrage, right? The tail is wagging the dog, so to speak. And what about elected officials? What kind of electeds do we get in an environment like this? Do we get electeds who want to be sober, who want to be careful, want to use good judgment, right? Who want to use justice? Well, that's, so, that's great, but electeds today in this ecosystem environment they have to, how can they get clicks, money, support, following? They have to trigger outrage, right? So we have a system that is beginning to breed a new kind of leader. And that's very dangerous as well. So I think that we need to focus tonight on, we'll make it three basic buckets, right? How do we get better? I know that this has been pretty grim. Let's, let's get strong now, right? How are we going to get better? We need to think about education. We need to think about institutions and we need to think about innovations. Innovations both, we'll, we'll make the third part of the bucket a two-part and say legislatively and technologically. Education, I know it, it can sound rote, but it, it's not. Think about this, think about the emergence of the printing press in the 15th century, right? And what that meant to the world. Well, it required hundreds of years of humans to adapt, to learn how to read. It was no longer the province of just the elites and the monks. And we were able to build democratic societies on that with public education. Well, now we have a similar revolution in information, but we don't have nearly as much time to get it right. Education needs to be in our schools, universities, needs to be in our libraries, in our civic institutions, CBOs, senior centers. We all need to be thinking about disinformation and shared reality and empiricism as really crucial tenets of our time. You know, there was a, not to get too political, but in 2016, there were all these candidates. One of them was Pete Buttigieg, and he said a couple of times, I didn't follow much of it, but I did, I did notice when he said, I think that democracy is really the most important thing we need to be talking about because it's really under threat. And he, he was implying all of this, I believe, but he was saying that a sense, our sense of shared reality is fraying badly, and we need to get to work on that because this is not going to fix itself. Institutions. The decline in the trust of institutions is not only an effect of this, it's not only a consequence of this, but it's also going to be something that allows this to get worse, right? We're going to see graphs later that are going to show what Americans' trust in institutions is all across the board. Media, Congress, science, you name it. 
that opens the way for this kind of thing to happen. We need to bolster democratic institutions. Without them, we're naked in this fight. Innovations, legislation, technology. And this is also to say there is no simple fix. And I don't even know what the fix is. But there are a lot of things that we need to do. We need to throw a lot against the wall. Legislation, we'll talk about some, some, some that might have some help, but definitely Congress is not going to save us. That's not going to be a single fix to this problem. Technological innovations, that's going to be a big part. The tech companies today have more power than any media we've probably ever seen in the history of humankind. They're going to have to be a part of the solution. Now, we might have to pull them really hard. We might have to, we might have to batter them a little bit. But they're going to have to be partners if this is going to work. Next slide, please. So um, very brief. Let's go back to history really quick. 1638, the first printing presses came to Massachusetts. They were a revolutionary way to communicate. Right away, they started generating revolutionary energies. The King of England didn't like it very much. We know how that story went. Important to know, those early papers, very partisan, not professional at all, just full of lies, outrage, outrage all the time, right? But it worked in that particular context. And it also was limited, of course, by things like public education, by how many papers were available, and so forth. Next came, next slide please, 10 and 11. Penny Press Age comes later, 19th century. This is where we go from the partisanship of the early press to a commercial bent, right? And this idea, suddenly fake news wasn't about politics and power as much as it was about commercial performance. And so, next slide please. What we saw right away was, I love this one, the Great Moon Hoax, I believe 1858 in the Sun newspaper, and it was a sensation, a whole story about how someone with a powerful telescope had discovered this whole civilization on the moon, and people loved it, circulation went through the roof, it was fantastic, right? And that taught those penny press folks an idea. So falsehood is happening a lot in early American society. Next slide, please. Then comes the yellow journalism age. We know Pulitzer, we talked about Hearst earlier. Hearst a local boy, San Francisco, that's always nice. Uh, anyway, they were titans of their age and loaded with falsehood in a circulation war. How bad did it get? I mean, life and death today, yes, life and death. Absolutely, falsehoods helped to drive America to war. In Cuba in 1898, a tremendous amount of loss of life. There was, a, there was a story about the Maine exploding in the harbor, right? Still, still dubious to this day, but absolutely, the newspaper titans helped drive America into a war of conquest. Newspapers and falsehoods as handmaidens of colonialism around the world. Uh, 14, let's go to the Golden Age. So then we have the kind of period which a lot of us remember, a lot of us think about. This one's really prominent, right? This is sort of the professionalization of news, right? You could call this a high point. You could call this a golden age. I, I would. Obviously, many imperfections. But newspapers, public, uh, public trust in news organizations at an all-time high in the late 60s, early 70s. Newspaper reporters seen as smart dashing, justice-oriented, swashbucklers, the smartest kids in colleges wanted to be newspaper men and women, right? Also, it was very progressive in the sense that, you know, they were getting a lot of people, um, you know, people of color, people, um, uh, gender equality. The newspaper was better than many industries of its time, right? So that's the golden age we remember quite a bit. It's a, I would call it a maturation. Go into the next stage, please. And like I said, and we we're talking about those, those stats, Early 70s, we reach a sort of peak point, right? A great deal of trust in the mass media. Nearly 80% of those polled in 1974, 75. Pretty amazing, right, to think about that today. Great deal of trust. We'd probably be in the single digits right now. Uh, next slide, please. So now, and right before I go into this, I want to just say one thing. There's going to be a couple of judicial cases and legislative reforms that are part of all this ecosystem. I want to mention them very briefly. 1964, New York Times, Sullivan, that was the one that established how difficult it is to sue the news for getting it wrong. They created the, the test. The litmus test was absence of malice. As long as you could not be proven to be trying to directly make a falsehood to harm someone, 
you would win your case. And that's obviously a very high burden of proof. So that enabled news gatherers to go out and aggressively report the news and not be too afraid of making a mistake. 1964 news, uh, New York Times versus Sullivan. Let's go into a case study very briefly. So this is last year, last summer. I am on my Instagram account, right? Having a fun time, looking at stuff, uh, probably being duped in different ways, uh, thinking I'm smarter than I am. And here I get a DM, slide into my DM. That's the parlance of the time. My friend sends me this and says, um, this, this, look at this guy. He is going to show you why the COVID vaccine is a fraud, right? I look at it and it's just loaded with all kinds of wacky stuff, right? The COVID vaccine is implanting chips and so forth. It also has stuff about, um, it's, it's, it's part of this carnivore diet. You got to eat all raw meat, all this weird stuff. My friend, who I grew up in high school, sensible man, completely bamboozled by these things, right? Completely off the rails, right? All the way in. That was just a taste. So I, I know this is untrue at first, first blush, but I decided to humor myself and do what we call lateral research. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So I started looking at this. I look at who the person is, right? I find out it's an IG account that has hundreds of thousands of followers, tremendous influence all over the world, right? I find out that this operator lists himself as the owner of Eat Nose to Tail, a Texas meat company, right? Commercial interest in this carnivore diet thing. Then I noticed that he's posted an original story from Newsweek. Ooh, Newsweek magazine. That sounds good. I like that. I grew, grew up reading that. Very trusted, right? I go to that Newsweek article. I see the story. The story is here. It's by Kevin Bass, MD, PhD student, medical school. Interesting. Under that powerful, uh, that powerful nameplate of Newsweek. And I read all about the COVID vaccine, politicization, and so forth. Then I do some more lateral research, and I discover that this story also exists in what's called the Tennessee Star. Tennessee Star, well, that sounds good, the star. That's been a name that's been used by newspapers for a long time. There was a Washington Star back in the day of Woodward and Bernstein. And I look, look at this very, very nice looking, very legitimate looking news source, right? I look at what is the Tennessee Star? I get to a Wikipedia page, has a lot of links there. There's a lot of value there. I find out the Tennessee Star is a conservative news and commentary website founded in 2017 in Franklin, Tennessee by talk show host Steve Gill. It's also part of a website, of all, a, a part of a whole coalition of other uh, Instagram accounts, other social media accounts, other websites. It's all, then I find out that it's all funded by the Tea Party movement and other influential Republican donors, right? Now, I've discovered this in a matter of minutes doing lateral research, using Google as my friend, using some basic tools, and an open mind, a skeptical mind. I bring all that information to my friend. What do you think he says? Nope. Fake news, right? My stuff's fake news. This is the legit. This is the age of cynicism. This is what we're battling against. The tentacles are everywhere, and we have a great deal of work to do. Before I go to the next section, I have to call up my colleague, Andrew, who's done some exciting research on this. Andrew, please come up and join us and share a little bit. So, yeah, thank you so much, Robert. I'm so happy to be here today, be here in front of all of you guys. Just to reintroduce myself, my name is Andrew Melendez. I'm a student at St. Mary's College. I'm a lifelong Richmond resident, and I'm actually a co-founder of a club that I started on campus called Bridge USA which is a student-led organization that aims to directly combat misinformation and political echo chambers at our college campus by bringing people together across the political divide and engaging in good faith arguments. Um, so that's been some of the really important stuff I've been doing. Um, but I wanna come here today because I wanna talk a little bit more about social media. And in particular, I really wanna focus on the many ways that it's being used today to perpetuate misinformation and spread uh, racial division across our country. Um, of course, as a young person myself, you know, I know just how uh, dangerous fake news can be. You know, I grew up in the age of social media, this age where virtually all the information in the world is easily accessible in the palm of my hand. But at that same time, there's so much news where we don't exactly know what is true or what is fake anymore. And so it's in this environment that we really start to see 
you know, some of the more sinister consequences of this new reality. So I brought a few examples today. I just want to just go over some of them with you guys so we can learn a little bit more about what exactly I'm talking about here. Um, so this is the first post right here. At this bottom left, we see a post um, about the Black Lives Matter movement. This one made its ways across Facebook and Instagram. This is actually one that I came across a few years back. And it seems to allege that the Black Lives Matter movement, which of course, as we know, is a African-American-led movement aimed at addressing racial inequities in the United States, had actually been using donations, or allegedly had been using donations in order to buy this big bus that was being used to move people back and forth from different protests. Um, now, of course, at first glance, just reading this headline seems to suggest that Black Lives Matter had been corrupted by greed or some sort of financial mismanagement. Um, but this post does another thing as well by specifically aiming to delegitimize the Black-led movement in its entirety. And it's pretty related to this next post as well. Los Angeles police, 12 white female bodies in garage freezer tagged Black Lives Matter. Now that sounds truly like despicable. It sounds horrible. But yet again, we're seeing the same idea of these awful headlines attacking what we know as a completely legitimate social movement by specifically targeting African-Americans and using these fake news posts to bring down the message of Black Lives Matter um, in its entirety. So I went ahead and just did a closer you know, look. I did some research on each of these posts. Um, and so let's start at this first one here. So when we looked something, when we look a little bit deeper into the Black Lives Matter, this bus post right here, I just did a quick Google search and was able to find that this bus was actually not purchased by anyone from Black Lives Matter. It was actually a team bus used by the professional basketball team, Toronto Raptors, to move their teammates uh, back and forth to different arenas. So while the photo is true, the headline above it um, is very, very misleading. Um, the same way we see this as well, this photo right here at the top right, um, you know, these photos right here have nothing to do with the headline, which in fact, this headline was actually also completely fabricated as well. And in doing my own research on the source here, 8 Now News, I found that this website actually um, actively engages in lots of misinformation and just creates uh, sensationalized headlines to drive readers into their website. So we're kind of starting to see some of the ways that, um, you know, misinformation is being used for profit as well. Um, now, of course, you know, most of us in this room, we have the skills and skepticism to find this out for ourselves. It was not hard for me to find out where these sources were coming from and debunk it. But of course, for millions of people who are scrolling through Facebook or going through Instagram every single day, reading these headlines are essentially to the extent in which they're gonna take in this information. And that's really dangerous. Andrew, is that a clue that it says bath salts? The uh, yeah, so the the article talked a little bit about how he was on bath salts, uh, but it's it's mostly it was all just really exaggerated, sensational stuff, and none of it was proven true. Um, even just putting this headline onto Google search gave up like it gave me about five um, articles saying about how it was already proven to be false. So it's just a lot of random stuff. But you know what I want to focus on is you know what really are the consequences of these kinds of posts here. Well, studies show that there's strong correlations between people's perceptions of different races and the ways that they're portrayed in media. It's very important to know. Whether it's in entertainment, television news, or even headlines on social media, all of these portrayals heavily shape how we view entire groups of people. And this can lead to dangerous outcomes, uh, many of which we're starting to see in recent years. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I wanna highlight, for example, the 2020 COVID pandemic. Um, this was a period of widespread fear across the entire world, and it confined us to our homes with only our phones and internet to keep us company. So you can kind of see <laughs> what's going to happen naturally. Um, it's no wonder then that you know many people would eventually come across these kinds of fake narratives on social media, claiming that the pandemic was a bioweapon created in China, you know, and all these different kinds of things. And you know, what I want to focus on is that this connection between COVID and China, although many scientists have already, you know, largely, uh, you know, debunked this claim, was then widely spread across social media with even the most prominent figures like you see here, Donald Trump, calling COVID a quote unquote Chinese virus. So it's no surprise then that during this period, um, actually I want to focus on this here, a UCSF study linked the rise of fake news headlines about China with the rise of anti-Asian hashtags and other kinds of posts on social media platforms like Twitter. And then at the same time, 
The Center for Study of Hate and Extremism would report, as you can see right up here, a 149% increase from 2019 to 2020 in hate crimes against Asian people living in some of the largest cities across the country. One more thing as well is from March 2020 to June 2021, there were more than 9,000 anti-Asian hate incidents that were reported to the advocacy group Stop AAPI Hate. So what does this tell us about the impacts of social media misinformation? It tells us that fake news can be easily spread beyond the confines of just our digital spaces. These false narratives have the power to really radicalize people who are susceptible to this kinds of influences. And it can lead to immense emotional, and in this case, uh, physical damages to all kinds of people. But in particular, people of color who are victimized by these warped social media portrayals. Today, we're witnessing a dangerous new trend today that if left untouched, can and will result in more lives being lost as people are further thrown into these echo chambers of racial resentment and hate. And, you know, as bad actors, as we see here in these previous posts and other foreign powers as well, begin to fully utilize social media as an agent of chaos, it's only then that we're gonna truly realize just how grave of a situation that we're in today. So I wanna thank you guys for that. And I'll go ahead and pass it back to Robert as well. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, a young person growing up, growing up right here in Richmond and just a tremendous young scholar and an emerging leader. Thank you so much for your research on this topic. Uh, next slide, please. So um, more data showing a deep distrust in the media, the media, the media. We know it connotes badly. What the thing is now is that this idea of the media, what it does, what it doesn't do, legacy media, concentration ownership, these are not really, they're not really pertinent issues at nearly as much anymore. This is really about Google, Facebook, and the like. They have all the power when it comes to dispersing information and, of course, becoming conduits of disinformation. Your average influencer of disinformation on Instagram has more followers than the Washington Post. The kind of person, a, 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 a pundit who goes on YouTube all day, has a bigger following than, well, certainly any regional media, but many um, legacy national media as well. That's where the power is. That's where we have to address this. In fact, the power is so great that the old guards of the, the old gatekeepers of me, uh, legacy media, they don't even know how it works. None of us do. It's proprietary algorithmic technology. If I could put on my king hat for one second, the one thing that I would do if I was president right away, when I would create a task force to say, we need to figure out how we can force Facebook, Google, and the like to give us more of their proprietary information so that we understand how it is that they're manipulating the public, creating those eyeballs, because they, no one knows more about human psychology today than the algorithms that are working for these trillion dollar market cap companies. Hugely important. A nonpartisan think tank determined that a dozen of main accounts, a dozen, were responsible for the vast majority of the anti-vaccine information, right? Hence, responsible for untold numbers of deaths, right? That's information health as public health. Oh, and one of the main drivers of the anti-vaccine information was a presidential candidate. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Enormously powerful, like what I said before. What kind of politicians will we get in the future? Those who are careful, those who are sober, those who are judgment, or those who are hunting for the outrage, the most wild claims of all. That they are the ones who are empowered in this new media ecosystem. Let's go to News Diet, please. News Diet, News Diet, News Diet. This is great. We need to think about our News Diet like we think about our uh, our food diet, right? This is directly correlated with mental health as well as physical health. What you're bombarding your brain with all day long is gonna have tremendous impacts, not only of course on your perception, your thoughts, your beliefs, but on your actual physical health as well because we know it's all tied together. So we know it's a holistic issue. So 
Um, to get a little bit of the data, you see more than 80% of Americans get their news from the smartphone, just 30% from television, just 8% from print, 76% of millennials getting most of their news from social media, 67% of those over age 65 getting mostly digital news, and obviously those folks very vulnerable to disinformation. But it's fashionable to say that mom or grandma or dad or grandpa are the ones who are susceptible, but we'll learn from data later. Those kids that help us work our smartphones, they're not necessarily immune to disinformation either. 18 to 29 say they prefer social media for it. 60% of users expect, expect their news to be inaccurate. They don't believe their sources, but they use it anyway. So what are they looking for? Triggers. Outrage, fear, tribalism. Next slide, please. It works. The most powerful digital tools ever conceived are aimed right at us and they're working. Next slide, please. Why? Well, because it takes us millions of years to evolve. It took us hundreds of years to get used to the printing press, right? And that worked out quite well. But like I said before, this is a challenge that is way huger in scope and sophistication, and we have way less time to deal with it. Let's go over some of the, some of the basics here. Uh, I love this. I came up with 12. Um, the mammalian brain, right? Uh, we've evolved over millions of years. They, what, what we have in our brain kept us alive for 99.9% .9 of human history, right? See it, believe it, run from it, attack it, eat it, whatever, right? Now we're expected to, you, to turn off that incognition, turn off our cognitive sides, and be able to sift through all of this. It's a tall order. We weren't hardwired to sift through disinformation or to safeguard democracy. We were hardwired to survive for something different. Artificial intelligence is obviously exploiting um, this, this primal need. Psychologist Daniel Goldman first coined the term in 1995 of amygdala hijacking. You may have heard this before. The amygdala is a portion of the brain that responds to fear, and um, it's, it's, it's on us now. Cognitive dissonance, very powerful form. It's a defense mechanism. Uh, it's one of those things where we believe what we believe. And to say, to reassess is really hard to do. So it's easier to reinforce. Now, when we had different information ecosystems, we trusted other people, we trusted wisdom, institutions, we could be persuaded to think of something different. We'd, be we'd have education, we would wind up being different people than we were when we were 18, 28, and so forth. Now we're diving down, we're doubling down into those problems. This is a lack of evolution personally that occurs because we're bombarded with cognitive dissonance enforcing information. Why are we bombarded for Not only are we looking for it, we're being fed it. Confirmation bias, huge, right? There's so much information in the world, it's important to draw a conclusion based on what we've already known, right? We have to do that to make sense of the world. That's always been the case to simplify the chaos. Now the chaos turned up times one million. This also creates that tendency to go into echo chambers and to go into peer groups and silos where we hear those same things that confirm those biases. Dunning-Kruger, we saw a whole lot of that during COVID, right? Uh, everybody was a medical expert about what we should or shouldn't do, right? My uncle just knew everything about what I, what I ought to put in my body and, uh, and what the effects would be, a public health master, right? Now, by the way, we see a whole lot of experts out there on international relations on what we ought to do here or there or wherever, right? We're naturally inclined to overestimate the value of our own opinions and beliefs. That can serve us well sometimes. It's good to have confidence, right? But with these tools, it becomes a weakness. Uh, we have our Bertrand Russell, of course. Uh, he saw this long ago before recognizing these tools. But, you know, we, we see this, hopefully, education, educated society. The more you know, one of the greatest things we learn in the world is the limits of what we know and all of what we don't know, right? And that is a really powerful thing. And how can you have that when you're raised under the onslaught of a disinformation campaign? Disinformation's power of proliferation. Uh, this one's big. Uh, you know, it's really, really crucial. I, I want one fundamental thought you've got to think about is one of the paramount problems in this whole, this whole conundrum is
The disinformation is geared to proliferate best, right? It's, it's those things, the more disinformation it is, the more outrageous it is, the system as it is, along with our brains as they are, they coalesce to create this powerful incentive where disinformation rules. We've essentially created a technological and societal ecosystem where disinformation flourishes. And real information, the hard truth, the unsexy truth, it lingers over and over again. We have to figure out how to turn this around, and it's a really thorny problem. The reward structures are all there for disinformation. Absence of guidance or, information, uh, or intervention, uh, this is crucial. You know, we, this is a big part of you know, not having trusted institutions. Social media companies, they haven't been able to stop the disinformation. Imagine this, right? To give you an, an example of how powerful this freight train is, Facebook, the creator of the genie, wants to control the genie. Do you want to know? I mean, they don't have all the answers either because they tried to do some good after the pain of 2016, 17, 18. And they created a campaign of what? Do you remember? The um, flagging the false news stories, right? Saying this is different. What happened? Backfired, right? When you hit it with that, people clicked on it more. They wanted it more, right? It doesn't work, it backfired. Have to recalibrate. It shows you that even, even those in possession of the greatest power and the greatest amount of the newest psychological information with the machine learning couldn't stop that, that freight train that got going. The blur between opinion and news, this is kind of quaint, but it's, it matters. Um, you know, it was very, very important. I'm, I'm an old journalist myself. In the old days, it was always crucial to have the opinions are on the opinion page, right? The news is on the news page. People knew that. That was a basic part of what, we, we, we weren't all news diet experts, but most people kind of got that, right? That's completely gone. False memory. This one is particularly pernicious, right? And this, this, is one, this is one that disinformation uh, users, the sophisticated ones, they love this, right? Now, we knew this in a less sophisticated way 30 years ago in news. We would write a story, and the story would wind up being wrong. And it's very embarrassing. Journalists, we hated that, right? We'd get slapped around by the editor that night. We'd have to, we'd have to come out hat in hand, have that correct, that dreaded correction on page two. It was really shameful, right? But the problem was, one of the problems was, you had to go to all that effort because it was not that simple. The correction didn't fix the problem. We knew that the front page story caused the harm in the first place and that couldn't be totally walked back. It would help. Well, I have the correction right here. People would believe that, that would help. But the false memory remains. Now in the age of disinformation, all the wheels are off, right? They love that, the ones who want to purvey that. Just get it out there and it works. This, this is an example of 2016, and it's also sadly a harbinger of what we're going to face in 2024, because it's going to get way more sophisticated with video AI and so forth. This is using, this is using crayon tools, right? Photoshop, put a couple of pictures together, put a headline there, the Pope endorses Trump, right? Not true, but there's millions who believe it, and even the ones who've been disabused of the belief, what did that do to their mindsets? We'll never really know, right? It has an effect. The imprint remains, and obviously, and Trump, by the way, is a master of this. The Obama situation is a perfect example. You just keep saying that he wasn't born in America. Everybody, everybody knows, most people know that's not true, but that false impression remains. And therefore, everything about his status, who he is, is undercut, right? He's been libeled, basically. And the false memory is so powerful. Uh, fear and cancel culture. Uh, this is a big one. Um, it's, I, I think it's less germane to what we're talking about now, but it still matters, right? The, we have to remember that, and this is part of not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. When we legislate against these things, you know, China is battling hard against disinformation, but they're doing it in a way that we don't want to do, right? However, we, we, we have to always remember, this is a, the, part of what makes this nation great despite everything I've said, 
is a freedom of thought and information. And if, if people get more and more afraid to be able to speak up for whatever reason, you know, whether it's, whether it's cancel culture, whether it's mobs online, or whether it's algorithms, that's going to be harmful to our democracy as well. Like I said earlier, the three big buckets. How do we restore truth and democracy worldwide? But let's start with this nation. Next slide, please. So there's some up there. But what I want to talk about, education, institutions, innovations. Recap them briefly, go into a little bit of detail. Education, news, literacy. It's sort of like, maybe you remember 30 years ago, it was in this consumer culture where everybody has a credit card and where money's flying everywhere and we're all winding up in debt, doing all this damage. How come there's no personal finance class in high school, right? You still have that, that, that argument, right? It, it definitely, it's, in other words, this, this nation, the way that it is, creates a system where there's a lot of sophisticated actors that are trying to take advantage of you in that, in that respect. So uh, we need to think about it that way. We now, not only is this a culture for all its good things where people can go into debt, there's going to be rapacious lenders and so forth all trying to get in your pocket, well, there's a whole lot getting into your mind. And that's arguably even more dangerous. We need news literacy all over the place. It's got to be in schools. It's got to be, now universities are doing well on this. They're, they're creating new departments. They're getting that direct, they're, they're, they're ramping up. Community-based organizations, senior centers, my personal favorite, libraries, the friends of the library here tonight. This idea of libraries, of bastions, of information, I wouldn't call it news, information literacy, right? Democratic literacy. This is vital, right? I think, because a lot of people do some hand-wringing, no one in this room, of course, but some people do hand-wringing about what do libraries look like in a time where people buy their books on Amazon or everybody reads online or all that, right? Those materialist concerns. True. But in this existential threat, I feel like libraries are the heroes that are right there in every one of our communities. Support your library. Yes. Absolutely. I was hoping I'd get an applause for something. There. <laughs> uh, you've, been, you've been really wonderful. There's been a lot of grim news here. I apologize. Uh, critical thinking, on a personal level, curating your socials. We'll talk about that more. But think of your news diet, right? Like you make a grocery list. We have got to curate the information. We can't just be passive recipients anymore. The algorithms will take you over, and they'll have you thinking up is down and down is up, right? Malcolm X said in 1964, the newspapers will have you believing that the good guy is the bad guy and so forth. Right? I, I, I'm sorry I butchered the quote, but he was absolutely right then in talking about the power of media to, in order to, to change your mind, to influence you in a noxious way, and now... We, we, need Mal we need people like Malcolm today, right? Because now the forces are much more powerful. Institutions. We have to save and bolster the free press. Schools, libraries, governments. Legislation and technology as well. I'll just touch on a few of these things, right? I'll, I'll make the case again, like I did before, on that thesis. All of this is made much more rampant by the decline of all the institutions around us, right? The democratic institutions, the pillars that help a democratic society remain on some kind of an evil keel, they've all been chopped down. And that allows stuff like this to run rampant. So these kinds of organizations, they have to be separate. When you hear somebody, I mean, what do, whether they are a Russian disinformation campaign people or someone else, when someone wants to destabilize your society, what are they going to do? They're going to come right at your trusted institutions right off the bat. Those are the ones who are trying to hurt you, right? They know that that's the way, that, that's what many dictators have done over time. Well, I'll, I'll leave them nameless. What can we do on a legislation point? Now, this is dicey, right? Because there's going to be a lot of legislation that's going to float around that can make problems worse than better. It's not the most precise tool, but it is part. Remember, no silver bullet. This is going to require a holistic approach. What are some that come out to right away? Well, uh, Mark Desaulnier, our local congressman, he has a bill that's still floating in Congress, hasn't gone anywhere, but it ought to be supported. And it's about allowing news organizations to have nonprofit status so that they can create new revenue models because the commercial advertising model is over, right? It's not sustainable. So the New York Times already created its own nonprofit wing. That's helpful, right? 
but he's got legislation that will allow all news organizations to, to act that way. And as we know, when you give nonprofit status, that allows new ideas to flourish, that allows new models to come about. The Warner Klobuchar Honest Ags Bill, that's another one. It's, it's not gone anywhere, but the idea was that we would have Facebook ads, all political ads on Facebook would have to have prominently who's funding them right there, right? It's an idea. I don't know if it's the right idea, but we need to be pushing our legislators to come up with new ideas all the time. And then, of course, there has to be a massive amount of technological innovation, right? What does Facebook, Google, the others have to do? They have to figure out ways, and, and we can push our legislators to push them, but we have to figure out ways. How do we weight information differently? Because the way it is now, Facebook's news feed, right, is weighting things, ver it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's dissuading truth to some degree. It certainly was, maybe it's gotten better in the last two years, but how do we do that? How do we create systems of authenticity, of authority? How do we provide people more context to understand information? Because the way that it's pumped out on our digital channels now provides none of that. It's a fertile ground for those who want to do disinformation. It's a fertile ground for people who want to say, I'm a doctor and here's my Newsweek article about COVID-19. Let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, we have the Mueller report. I only wanted to bring that up only to say, um, you know, th this was a, a, me a monumental report in my mind, right, that touched on all kinds of things that I'm talking about today. And all we really got from it was no collusion. Okay. <laughs> well done, right, by, by someone who wants that done. But the reality, and, and by the way, it wasn't necessarily, it was, it was not provable. But anyway, the high standard of proof. But absolutely. They dissected in tremendous detail how foreign governments easily manipulated our disinformation systems in order to create an entirely chaotic election environment and totally destroy trust in our institutions, even our most sacred institutions, which are our voting machines, right? So digital news literacy, it's vital to our education system, but more important, it's vital to our news society. We need to ramp up quick. It's gonna create, it's gonna cause major investments. It's gonna require major investments. Let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, here we have Tocqueville and Jefferson. Tocqueville, a, a Frenchman who came in the 19th century. Newspapers more necessary in proportion as men become more equal and individualism more to be feared. To suppose that they only serve to protect freedom would diminish their importance. They maintain civil civilization. Were it left to me to decide, I'd have uh, newspapers without government, right? In other words, both of them are talking about how, you know, I'm always swinging back and forth. I'm always talking about disinformation, mortal existential threat, terrible time, and then I always have to remind ourselves, we have to have free information also, though. We can't lose that. How do we thread that needle? Next stage, please. Next slide. Up, there's lots of incredible NGOs and nonprofits out there. I encourage you to look at it. I encourage you, again, curate your media. If you have social media platforms, then follow ones that are trusted sources. Now, what are trusted sources? Now, as long as you're not too far down the rabbit hole, it's not too hard to find, right? There's major commercial legacy media, you know, the San Francisco Chronicle, East Bay Times. What's important about these institutions? Not that they're right all the time, but that they try to get it right. They're accountable to their communities that they're covering, unlike the disinformation campaigns on both scores. Then look at all the CBOs and NGOs. There's, there's a, this, is a, uh, this, this is a cause for hope. There's a fertile uh, springing up of all kinds of smart people and organizations getting out there trying to address this problem, creating new organizations that are all about how do we combat disinformation. This is one, the Trust Project, they talk about best practices, journalist expertise. There are many others. You've probably heard of them. Of course, Snopes fell under the acts of politicization during 2016, right? But it's still a legitimate source. But there's many others out there, right? Um, there's, you know, AP.org, NPR, so forth. Next one. Next slide, please. Because remember, we have to understand truth decay. Now, the Rand Corporation, they did a whole project on this. Again, lots of money, lots of smart people involved in this fight. And they come out with, 
what is truth decay as a system in our society? And they talked about these four pillars, cognitive biases, they're, they're triggering one another. Changes in the system, political and social polarization, demands on the educational system. And you can see, you never, it's like, it's like a, a circle, a, an unvirtuous circle. You never know what starts where, right? But they feed into one another. But of course, this, this is my favorite. This is the driver that we're trying, to, we're trying to really attack. I feel like if we really get at the nub of that, um, we can really make progress. But at the same time, we, of course, again, have to work on ourselves as news consumers and have to work on our institutions. I mentioned earlier, um, you know, uh, people of certain generations get a lot of flack for not being able to recognize fake news. Uh, this is a cause for both, I guess, equity and, um, fortunately, pessimism. Stanford study, recent Stanford study showed 96% of high school students, this is in the, this is in the Palo Alto area, 96% of high school students surveyed, sophisticated kids, failed to recognize that a fossil fuel company was funding a particular report about why climate change is, you know, fake or whatever, or not really known. It's getting harder and harder to, to, to fight fake news and to do so, um, you know, given our mammalian brains, given our systems, we need more support. At, at also, that same study showed more than half of those youth failed to recognize that a Russian-produced fa Facebook video about voter fraud, it was a grainy video, you may have remembered it, I, I, saw, I remember it, false memory, uh, was evidence of real voter fraud occurring in the United States. Next slide, please. So institutions, uh, you know, lift them up, right? Libraries, again, you know, vital role in, in they're, they're, they're a key pillar of where this country went from and has become today, right? A huge part of our ascent as a more equitable, more enlightened society. It's got to be part of that story again for the next future, for the next generation. The needs are different, but they must adapt. The needs are different, but the need is there. And the power is there. The trust is there. It just has to be cultivated. We once went to libraries, as I mentioned earlier, to find information we could acquire nowhere else. But now we have to go to libraries for proportion and higher understanding of the information that bombards our public and private spaces. Legislation, technology, policy. Again, these systems are not going away. The deep and inherent problem, I want to recap, is engagement, virality, democratic impulses on the social platforms in our disinformation environment are exactly the threats to democ democratic systems here and around the world. Authoritarianism is on the march around the world. And this is a big part of it. It might be the biggest part of it. What can we do? Curate your socials. Find yourself uh, trusted sources. Be a good sharer, consumer. Don't share fake news, right? If you're outraged by something, think twice before you give that to somebody else or push it into their email or wherever else. That's exactly, usually, what those disinformation system monitors want you to do. You're falling into that trap when that happens. Talk to people. Definitely don't get an online debate over something that's a triggering idea. One of the key legislative, by the way, one of the key technological innovations might be this idea of slowing down virality, right? In other words, you create some kind of governor or a trigger where the stuff that goes truly crazy, right, the October surprise type stuff, especially important during an election campaign, you know, in the old days, newspapers stopped reporting on a campaign like one or two days out, right? That's the kind of thing, that kind of principle, we need that all the time, right? When something is going crazy like a wildfire, we have to have people stepping in because this is all happening automatically. This is all AI. We have to have forces. We have to have some systems that are able to check that. Uh, the SIF technique. Let's use that, right? This is great. Um, I encourage you to look them up. Uh, it, it's, it's fantastic. There are many others, many variations on this, right? But if we just had this one tool, 
this could help millions of news consumers all over the country and the world, right? Stop and think, investigate. By investigate, it's always important to search laterally. Never go down vertically into the same website, right? Into the same source. Don't go, that's a rabbit hole. You always avoid the hole and go around it. What does Google say about this? What does Wikipedia say about this? Wikipedia, while not perfect, has citations on it, right? Find, look at how are other people or other institutions talking about the same issue. Expand your mind, right? We used to talk about that, diversity of news sources. It's too easy to lapse out of that. Trace, right? If there's something that's questionable especially, put it in quotes, put it in Google, see who else says it, see what else is happening. Also, I would say subscribe. Subscribe to a high-quality journalistic output. I have a New York Times subscription. I value it very much. I think that they do great work. They're not perfect, but I know that they are not engaging in a disinformation campaign against me. And so I, I like that news. I like to read the Chronicle. I like to read the East Bay Times as well. Um, you know, support some local journalism. Um, it's, it's not going to solve the problem, but it is going to ensure that you get some broccoli into your news diet. With that, let's bring up the next. I'm a firm believer in the people. If given the truth, they can be depended upon to meet any national crisis. The great point is to bring them the real facts and beer. And my question to you is, is that fake news? The truth is, I don't know. I didn't check. But I like the quote so much because what I'm, my point I'm trying to make is, the systems, the AI bots, it's all, I'm not going to lie, it's a formidable adversary that is going to grow. And it's, it's serious. It's, I, you know, I'm optimistic for the future of my children, but I also know that this is a dangerous time um, in terms of what the future means. It's moving so fast. But I believe in the people. Just like Edward R. Murrow in the clip earlier, without the humans who are using it, the television is just wires in a box. Well, sadly, the television is a million times more powerful today. This is a system that's not just inert. It's sentient, it does its own thing. But as humans, we still have control. We still can be empowered. We still have hope. With that, let's go into that Q&A. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. Um, this has been so exciting, so stimulating. I love uh, being with you and talking about this topic. And I just throw them at me. No, no question is too out there. Let's go. I'm going to ask the first. I'm not sure this mic is working right here. I'm trying. It is, Angela. Thank you. OK, so when we're talking about news, and I was waiting to see if this was going to come up, what are your thoughts about, because you mentioned Instagram and, and Twitter and all of that, but what about TikTok? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up, right? So TikTok is another platform, right? And in that way, there's a similarity. As you probably all know, recent legislation, right, really cracked down on TikTok. They've taken the approach of this sort of, this, this ownership attack, right? Break it up. And so now they've been able to do that, Congress, because you know, TikTok has Chinese ownership or whatever, right? So TikTok is particularly vulnerable to this because owned by the Chinese, uh, there's a lot of concern about the, that government. Um, naturally, their lobbyists aren't going to be as powerful in Washington as Facebook's and Google's. Um, so that's an interesting test case. Now, what I think uh, is I think that TikTok, and I'm on it myself, I, I, don't, I don't use it much, but um, I think that it's potentially very dangerous. Um, is it something that is right now a Trojan horse in our society? Uh, I think that there's some evidence to that, yes. I think not the platform itself. The platform is inert. But I think that people are using it in a way that's extremely powerful, also targeted particularly towards young people, and is a place where a tremendous amount of... Not, they've all got the disinformation. But TikTok's particular platform is so powerful, so popular, so awesome, so engaging. It's also a powerful tool of disinformation. So uh, what I think about TikTok is um, I think that it's another platform, not too much different than the other ones. 
Uh, I think that in some ways it could be worse. I think that Chinese ownership is concerning. I do think that that we, I think that I, I'm not. We're not in a war, but I think that um, there is definitely a, a a rivalry globally for what the world will look like in the 21st century, and I think that nations like China and Russia would prefer the world to look more like they look than we look, and I think that TikTok is is potentially dangerous now. Whether this, this legislation gets at it, the breakup idea, by the way, I don't necessarily love. Like if you say, we could fix this problem by breaking up Facebook, it's too big. I don't necessarily agree. Um, I, my guess is that there would just be new players that would pay, take up that space and they might, not, they might be worse than the ones we have. Uh, the TikTok one's a special case. That's also, by the way, why Instagram was able to sort of take TikTok's recipe last year and be super popular with it because no one's gonna defend TikTok's proprietary um, technology since it's a Chinese company. So, I'm sorry for the meandering answer, Angela, but I think that TikTok's pretty dangerous. Um, I wouldn't let my kids on it. I do go on it myself. I think that um, there's a lot of disinformation on it and I think it's particularly powerful. Now, that said, there's also all kinds of really fun stuff with cats and dogs and everything else on it too. Great question, Angela, by the way. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. I think we could talk about it for hours. But I always believe you follow the money. And talking about TikTok, I don't know if TikTok is going to be much better off with Steven Mnuchin, who was the guy who was trying to take it over, the former Secretary of the Treasury, than it is with the Chinese, but that's a different issue. But uh, talking, about, obviously, the, the big tech companies have huge uh, lobbying budgets. And how do you expect to be able to counteract that? Because I mean, much smaller and not as rich organizations like the NRA, for example, have been able to put a, a, a great lock on many efforts to, to regulate, in the case of the NRA, you know, weapons. So to try to regulate uh, the big tech companies to me, uh, which is what is necessary, and you know, back in, you had big oil companies decades, centuries ago, they were broken down because of monopoly concerns. But I don't see any of that uh, coming anytime soon. So it, it's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great concern. And uh, as opposed to, for example, I don't know if you're aware that the, the European Parliament just passed regulation to regulate uh, AI, you know, artificial intelligence. But I don't see that coming either in, in, in the American legislation. And, and by the way, the breakup of TikTok was adopted in the house, but it's doubtful that it's going to pass the Senate. Mm -hmm. So you know, don't hold any great hope there either. But anyway, we could talk about more, but to me, follow the money is very important. Uh, how the political advertising and disinformation goes on, uh, it used to be Fox News, I don't know how big Fox News is in that, uh, the weight of Fox News in that galaxy is nowadays, I think it's probably being shifted into big uh, social media companies, but it's, it's, it's really uh, concerning and it's also should be a subject of interest to all of us and for the future of the right market. Thank you so much. Now, there's a lot there. I'm going to try to get it all. Um, if I miss something, bring me back, please. Um, absolutely, I agree. Um, there's always the big, in our system, there's always the big concern about capturing, right? Big systems, big money, lobbying Washington, capturing regulators, being unable to, to sell them. You mentioned the fossil fuel companies. That is a concern, absolutely. But on the other hand, you know, we did see Facebook, you know, really get dragged in front of Congress a lot uh, in the aftermath of 2016. They have changed their platform to a great deal. I, so in other words, I, I am concerned about that as you are. Um, and it is true that chopping them down, right, big, bigness in that respect could be a factor and could be remedied by chopping them down. That is true, but I'm not sure that that's the best way to go. It could be. Um, I, I tend to believe that we can still, um, you know, bring these systems to heel, even though they're big and powerful and have lobbyists and all of that. I, I tend to believe that we can, as a government, if the people demand it, right? If we're, if we're going, if we're pushing in that direction. And I, and I am heartened by what happened with Facebook and Google in the aftermath of 2016. Yes, on, 
On the issue of, of TikTok, yes, it passed the House. It probably won't pass the Senate. The Senate has indicated not interest, but, but the progress is there. And it's, it's not a surprise to me at all that it's TikTok rather than the other two that is going to face that music first. So I think that we, we, you know, we might get there. Um, it's possible to get there faster than we think. I'm not sure. Um, on the issue of European regulation, uh, very important, absolutely. So it's really, really difficult. Now, one thing I'll point out is like in Germany, they have regulation, um, some very powerful regulation on the social media companies about disinformation on the platforms. And what it is, it's essentially big fines for purveying disinformation on your platform. You can imagine the challenge of that in this country, right? I don't need to go into it. That's not, that's not part of our culture, our system. Germany is a different place, right? Um, Germany is not China, but it's also not America. So that might not be um, a legitimate place for us to go. However, um, the other aspect of the regu regulating AI, um, again, very thorny, but I think that I'm not an expert on this at all, um, nor the other stuff, frankly, but uh, I, will op I will opine. Um, I think that the problem with AI regulation, okay, which could affect presumably this as well, of course, is the world, I'm getting, I'm getting far afield here, but the world has this incredible race for AI. In some ways, it is similar to nuclear, uh, the nuclear race. And if we put the brakes on it here, like there was that letter by 300 tech and uh, intellectual thought leaders saying, pause AI. Now, they may have believed that. I, I tend to think a lot of them didn't necessarily believe that. They just wanted to raise the issue. Um, the problem is, of course, if we pause AI, um, China's not going to pause AI, and Russia's not going to pause AI. And these tools are probably, if not already, going to be way more powerful than nuclear weapons ever were. So that is a tremendous enigma conundrum that I, um, I, I, I am glad I'm not in the position to make that decision, um, but I don't know where we go with that. But that's, I think that that's, that's, that's the dilemma we face. AI, existential threat to humanity long term, absolutely, and long term not that long. But in the short term, existential threat to America if uh, authoritarian regimes have it and we don't. Are there, are there any other part of your questions that I didn't miss? Uh -huh. Thank you, sir. Thank you. scary stuff. Um, I think what's driving AI is uh, wealth and uh, looking for a new uh, source of revenue. And uh, it's being sold and sold hard all over our media. I think, I think it's being driven out of uh, Silicon Valley. I don't think China and uh, Russia are the originators or even looking at it as a weapon system. Uh, we're the beginning of that. And uh, so I'm, I'm really uh, worried about AI and I, I don't see that um, uh, fear-driven approaches, you know, oh, they'll have it, we won't. I think that's the excuse for the atomic bomb. And uh, so we're, we're driving toward that faster than they are because we want to Uh, the other thing is uh, public relations. I think I think all of this uh, is is comes from that. Everything you're talking about, the whole manipulation thing that's going on uh, with the new media, is all driven by the science of public relations, which you know it came about to manipulate our brains. <laughs> We've gotten very good at it uh, in this country. And now it's moved into politics. And, uh, and the internet is just uh, good delivery for uh, public relations. And so I, I, don't, I don't know if knowledge is going to defeat public relations because 
it's a way to get under your defenses, and it's scientific. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I want to highlight, I agree uh, with a lot. Um, when you say AI is driven by the Silicon Valley, and we say we're driving it, and we're leading it, that's absolutely true. I, I believe that completely, so, absolutely. Um, on the part of you know, what other what, what adversaries on the global stage, would they like to, to change that dynamic? Uh, maybe you, you might be less concerned about that than I am. I understand that. Um, public, you bring up a great point. I know you're probably well-versed in you know, Edward Bernays and Ivy Lee and their incredible work um, that probably has, you know, imagine, imagine the toll that's taken on humanity in the last hundred years. And now those ideas are just hopped up on the steroids of new uh, technologies to a degree that you know they, they may like and they may have never uh, thought possible. So um, I, I definitely agree with that that origin thesis. That was really good. Thank you. I want to comment that, um, that what I see on Facebook is, is so disturbing to me. Uh, one of the things that comes up, I don't know, it just pops up all the time, is the man on the street. And the man on the street, he goes and asks just random people, like, simple question. Like, how many states are in the United States, or what continent is the United States on? It's just really simple stuff. And our young people, cannot answer. And these are young people who have been through school, they've graduated high school at least, and some of them have also gone to college. Now, they're not the, the one segment of, of college graduates that are, you know, in CEOs and, and their lawyers and their doctors and stuff. That's an average man on the street, okay? It's so disturbing. But then, in my own personal life, I have to argue with my young people and my family when they tell me they don't need to have any education from the system because all of the books are biased from the colonialism and, and you know and the empire uh, you know the empire of the United States uh, which was connected to England and the empire of the all over they don't have to because they can go and they can ask Google or they can ask Alexa and that's going to give them that the information I'm saying do you realize that the information that you may get on a particular um, search may be totally incorrect, and you don't know because you didn't bother to pay any attention in your high school class. You don't know the simple thing of what Hitler did, how he moved through the stages, and so therefore you can't see that Trump is using his, his book, and he's going through the stages, and one Facebook thing said, well, we're already on step eight, you know, we are in a terrible situation. We've got half of the country who are supporting that person who is following a Hitler playbook, but they are also unable to answer, what is the capital of your state? You know, uh, it, it's like, it just, it's just, I can't even imagine. I wasn't the greatest student in school, but I was interested, and I remember them saying, I think you had something up in your quotes. If, if people don't do anything, if they just stay inactive, then they're part of the problem. They allow the evil to happen. I don't, didn't say that quote right, but you know which one. No, that was very good. Thank you. Then the other one is, if you don't know any history, even if it's their history, okay, is that exactly right in that incorporating or including your history, you're going to repeat those mistakes and you're going to fall in the same hole. So there's a lot of people, in my opinion, at least half of the United States voting public, that don't know why World War II happened. And so therefore, they don't know why Hitler rose to power. They don't even know why it mattered. All they know, everybody knows, is six million people were killed in that situation. But most of the same people don't know that more than 20 million people were killed in the Congo by King Leopold. This is the information of the education piece that's missing. And it's so sad because
because the libraries are not being utilized, you know, like they used to be. I used to be the best trip on Saturday was to have permission to go to the library and just stay in there for hours before I checked out my books and, and went home to, you know, explore whatever was in the books that I selected. <coughs> They're not interested. They're not interested in that. They only want to be on the tablet and on these platforms and yep. looking at all of the uh, entertainment. So I think that education is really hard. And then you see the kids throwing things at the teachers, beating the teachers up, walking out of the classes. You have an uneducated public in the United States. Yep. I, uh, so. No, that was very good. Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to disagree with you on one little point. Uh, when you said that you weren't a good student, I find that hard to believe. So I'm going to disagree there. You were obviously a good student. I will say we could have a whole presentation about what these social media, web-based disinformation systems, what they mean for the health and the education and well-being of our youth. That, What so, you do, you can't have any boundary, you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, you can't enforce the way my generation was brought up. We did have rules, we did have consequences. Seems like this generation don't have rules and don't have consequences. Yeah. Uh, so, what we know is that these systems are massively deleterious to the well being and mental health of our children. When they are on their screens a lot and they're using, not, and it's not just screen time, like there could be good screen time, but when they're on their screens using these kinds of platforms unregulated, we find that kids have anxiety, we find that kids have higher rates of teen suicide, we find that they can't think, they perform poorly in school. It is a public health crisis. What we need to do is have is strongly regulate what our children do online. And I know that's hard to do. We can't lock them up. These systems are powerful and they're everywhere. And I don't have a direct answer for you. I can only say the danger is real. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Just, uh, just a quick comment. Yes. Um, Thank you. Sorry. Uh, when you were going through some of this, I was thinking of um, Marshall McLuhan. The medium is the message. Excellent. So it just was like, oh, geez, we're going back, and we're going back, and we're going back, and it's like this cycle. Um, it's interesting. And, uh, anyway, I, think that, I think that McLuhan would, um, would not be surprised that his theory still remains, but he would be surprised probably. He probably never could have anticipated the sophistication of our current environment. I mean, when you think of all the innovations in the last 20 years or 10 years, um, this is the one. Um, what has happened to our information systems has radically changed uh, humankind across the world for good and bad. Almost half of their survey of 2075 had visited a physical library within the past 12 months. So there's hope. Yay, libraries. That, that's tremendous hope. And um, I really appreciate you citing that data. And what that tells me is that when institutions adapt to a new time, they can be successful in their mission. And to the degree to which that, that data is true those libraries and those library leaders have really made a difference. Can you say that again, please? <laughs> 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 yeah, no, for, for the back, absolutely. You know, I mean, libraries as institutions can adapt to this environment, can be appealing places that draw young people and provide the kind of guidance, access, safe space that they need, that they've never needed as much as they do in a time like today.
Is there any hope at all for some, some platform of the world will start seeing the world as a community and, you know, um, as, a, as a human environment where everyone is, is part of it? And it just seems to me that instead of, uh, there, we don't see any real efforts, you know, I'm not talking about a religious movement or anything, but some kind of a social movement that sees the basic humanity in everyone and does things to bring that. Sometimes uh, we really do have the best for last. I don't know if that was the best, but it was very good. I'm so glad you brought that up. Thank you, sir. It was actually part of my presentation. I glossed over it. But one of the things that people are thinking about, and, and I believe um, def definitely has some traction, some merit, um, it's an exciting idea, is this idea, well, first of all, on, on the bigger level, all that talk about institutions, 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 certainly one of the things that we ought to do is have our government, our, our tremendous wealth, we should be channeling more of that into public media, right? Public media needs to grow with the time. That's not the panacea, but it's been so dwarfed by these powerful algorithmic social media companies, it just doesn't keep up. I mean, a few of us listen to NPR, but it's just not in the space as it should be, right? So Funding public media corporate, independent public media corporations. It's not government controlled, um, you know, Pravda or whatever. That is really, I think, a big part of what reform looks like. Then you brought up the social chat. I love this. So I, I think there are people who floated this idea of like uh, NPR social or public media social or something like that. So I totally believe that there is a wide open space, a wide open niche for exactly what you're talking about if someone occupied it. Of course, the startup costs are high, the competition is fierce, the government could, they could launch a corporation to play into that space, but I think that people are hungry for a space where it's not so divisive, where, there, where there's more. I mean, you see these little niche ones all over the place where people share scientific research and, you know, Reddit to some degree has some of this going on, but a major player on the scene with an entirely different culture and ethos, I think there's a lot of energy for it. It's just got to, I don't know exactly how to start it. I think the government could play a role in that as well. So thank you so much for bringing that up. I think that's I think that's part of what a very broad and diverse basket of reform could look like. With that, we'll close. Thank you so much. <laughs>